So uh, let me uh, then go ahead and introduce our speaker. I'm delighted to have Rob Bodis uh, joining us. He's been with us before uh, here at McGill. He is a senior research fellow at the Academy of Finland Center of Excellence for the History of Experience at Tempera University. And uh, he's a historian of, uh, of many things, of emotion, of experience, uh, of uh, phenomena like pain of, of great interest to us. And he's written a, a number of wonderful books. Uh, and he uh, contributed a chapter to this book, Culture, Mind and Brain. So we're very honored to have you with us again, uh, Rob, and look forward very much to your presentation. Thanks very much uh, for the invitation and thanks everyone for coming. <laughs> um, uh, and I wanna congratulate uh, you, Lawrence, and, and the editors uh, um, for the publication of, of this book. Um, and I was just saying before everyone was let in that um, actually I would have loved to have uh, really dug into this extensively before presenting to you, but um, my contributor copy was delivered and promptly stolen. So that's just how desirable this book is. So this one arrived 90 minutes ago. Um, so uh, it's a little a little thick. Um, so, but I have read, um, because they were sent to me uh, digitally, I've read the introduction and the epilogue. And I have to say that I'm, I'm extremely happy to be uh, involved with such a project of um, thoroughgoing interdisciplinary intent. Um, I haven't read too many things uh, that can compare or compete with the introduction to this volume. Um, and I think it provides a great platform for us actually to continue to explore what interdisciplinary research on the dynamic relation of culture, mind, and brain might actually be like in practice. Um, and I'm going to talk today a bit about how the discipline of history can fit into uh, this interdisciplinary practice, how history serves as both a producer of knowledge um, that has a significant purchase on, for example, um, social neuroscientific research agendas, but also history as a vital critical mode of inquiry that can, and I would argue should influence the kinds of research questions that we ask in this uh, interdisciplinary space. Um, before I get into it, I want to say something briefly about the scale of the challenge here. Um, just from a, my, my personal experience of trying to do this. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in the last few years talking to audiences comprised of many different disciplines uh, and specialisms. And I've often found myself at the juncture of, uh, shall we say, unfortunate competing uh, pessimism. <laughs> um, much of this pessimism or resistance actually comes from historians. Um, and I spend probably more time trying to convince them of the merits of this kind of interdisciplinary collaboration than I do talking, say, to psychologists uh, or neuroscientists. Um, many historians have suggested to me um, that social neuroscientists, cultural psychologists, and psychiatrists not only have no interest in hearing what the disciplinary discipline of history can offer them, but also that they have absolutely nothing to offer to historians in return. And I shake my head at it, but uh, I have to ask where it comes from. Um, and I think it comes from a combination of ignorance and of uh, apprehension. Um, there's a deeply ingrained fear of fields of knowledge that have traditionally been beyond the ken of the humanities. Um, and for many historians, this means whether implicitly or explicitly, that the question of what a human being is or how what it means to be human has changed have been deferred or else put beyond the range of our inquiry. And I think you, you can practice history like that if you want, um, but to do so, uh, I think packages it with an admission that you're a secondary discipline. Um, and at worst, this kind of approach is 
is predicated on something uh, ready-made about the human or about human nature. And when it is like that, it's usually a universalist view of human nature. There's actually, seems to me anyway, to be fundamentally opposed to the whole project of historicism. So that's in general, but at, interestingly enough, the strongest resistance among historians actually comes from those historians most actively engaged with things like the history of emotions. Um, and it comes from a host of frustrations uh, that includes things like the plurality of psychological models that fall on universalist or cultural lines, um, and they don't know how to pick. Um, a sense that um, historians' own qualitative research uh, in these areas is invisible uh, or ignored. Um, there are um, some past collaborative failures, uh, which I won't mention, um, which lo loom quite large in the memory. And there is as well a perception, and I think this may be the, the key point, that the institutional inertia and funding logic and publishing logic of, say, psychology is simply too powerful to be changed by the force of new thinking. And there is obviously a problem there, um, but that's the kind of problem, as far as I'm concerned, that ought to inspire us to work towards a solution. Um, Instead, what I found is that some very prominent historians of emotion, some in private and some in public, uh, have thrown up their hands and given up. Um, and that, that kind of resignation keeps us on parallel tracks of knowledge production. Um, and I think to our mutual detriment. Uh, so I often meet with this pessimism and resistance right where I would have hoped to find the opposite. On the other hand, uh, when I have talked to psychologists and neuroscientists, uh, I have encountered really specific points of resistance, um, and that often makes me check my starting points. Um, it's quite difficult to stay upbeat uh, when you hear, say, that uh, psychology will have no interest in history until history becomes a predictive science. Uh, or when a neuroscientist says that their arguments are based upon the neutral and objective analysis of data and mine are based merely upon a kind of charismatic spin. Um, sometimes you just can't help but feel the gulf between disciplines and, and feel a kind of frustration that some of the basic tenets of the critical bent of scholarship in the humanities have failed to register across the aisle. Um, so, I mean, it's for, that, it's for that reason, actually, that I'm really uh, celebrating a book like this, um, which strives to get us off our parallel tracks and onto convergent tracks. Um, and I think we have to be realistic about what that means. Um, as we converge, we're all going to experience some theoretical and methodological attrition. Uh, bits are gonna fall off. Um, and I think it's necessary. Um, unless and until we're prepared to come together and find out what our common questions are, what our major problems are, uh, we'll be traveling under the illusion of a kind of theoretical and methodological soundness. Uh, in the best case, I think we could see interdisciplinarity, um, not multidisciplinarity, but a real coming together to a new space as a kind of uh, controlled crash. Um, the pessimisms that I, I've sort of talked about, I think are at root about not wanting to deal with that crash because people feel there's too much at stake that they're invested in. Um, what I want to do is welcome a sort of controlled collision. Um, okay, so that's by way of a, you know, a, like almost like a personal um, beginning. I'm going to just uh, launch my slides here. Uh, and hopefully you can see them. Um, 
And these slides really are um, just essentially just visual uh, footnotes. Um, so you can see a little bit of the things that I'm, I'm uh, name checking as we go. So I'm gonna start by briefly recapping what my chapter in the Culture, Mind, and Brain uh, volume uh, put forward. Um, and then I wanna put my contribution into a, a broader context of recent theoretical and methodological developments in the discipline of history. Um, in the main, because it's been almost two years since I wrote the chapter for this book um, and things really have moved on apace. So in this chapter, I tried briefly and succinctly to show how historians have arrived at an understanding of the historicity of the culture brain dynamic um, from as it were, the outside in. That is how we came to understand the contingency of things like the emotions and the senses through studies of the traces of past feelings along with their expressions, conventions uh, and prescriptions, representations, and also importantly, their politics. Stemming from uh, the analyst observations of Lucien Febvre in the 1930s and 1940s, Historians have amassed an enormous body of evidence from antiquity to the recent past concerning situated, culturally mediated, contextually specific human experiences. From the mid 1980s, there have been significant theoretical and methodological developments that have taken us from an initial preoccupation with um, culturally specific emotional expressions to a much more complex understanding of brain, body, world, dynamics, feeling, thinking, and acting. And uh, a really major player in this development uh, was William Reddy, um, who was trained as an anthropologist, um, made this segue into history uh, in the late 1990s, um, and came up with the term um, emotives in this article against constructionism. Um, to describe the dynamic relation between feeling rules, that is cultural prescriptions for the expression of emotions and inward feelings. An emotive is a process in which inward feelings are negotiated to make best fits with feeling rules, which in turn can both disrupt the inward feeling and destabilize the feeling rule. And this uh, contribution was a vital step for understanding the how of emotion change over time. It took emotions out of stasis for historians and pointed us to the power structures that underlay emotion cultures and emotional regimes. Now, Reddy primarily was focused upon uh, verbal utterances. And that spurred a particular interest in the importance of sensory and affective concepts and the ways in which they were contextualized in different languages, both living and dead. Rather than begin with the principle that such concepts can be translated into uh, contemporary psychological categories, we, or at least some of us anyway, uh, take the view that understanding these concepts has to be reconstructed according to the context in which we find them. In other words, by looking for what is conceptually distinctive about situated concepts in the past, we find one means of access to what was experientially distinctive in the past. The primary step, therefore, for historians who are interested in such things is to discard what we think we know about the emotions, the senses, about human feeling and, and experience and approach the past on its own terms. We can justify this as being in line with general historiographical best practices, um, our biggest fear, after all, is uh, anachronism. But we find additional support for this approach in the recent work of social neuroscientists, too, um, who are working on the importance of conceptual development in emotion development. And if, as this work posits, the conceptual field has a real bearing on the experiential field, then it should be enormously important to both historians and social neuroscientists alike that we have evidence of enormously different conceptual repertoires for what might today be understood as 
affective experience. The evidence of the biocultural brain allows us the license to take seriously the possibilities of historical experience as distinctly unfamiliar. But it also implicates, we think, our work on the future of a social neuroscientific uh, research agenda. Um, and I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. Uh, beyond the conceptual, which has underscored our emphasis on change over time and place, historians have applied the same kind of approach to the situation of nonverbal expression and to emotional practices, which has reinforced the view that human feeling and human experience is historically contingent. On the one hand, the language of faces and bodies has been shown to be as specific and mutable as are verbal utterances. On the other hand, all of these processes have been shown to work through situated and historically specific practices such that feeling and expressing are elements of doing. Um, this is the notion, if you like, that emotion is a verb. There's also been a significant focus on uh, material contingencies that have had a direct bearing on brain body systems in specific historical configurations. Uh, neurohistory emerged about um, 12, 13 years ago after the work of Daniel Lord Smale in an attempt to try to understand psychological change over time. Neurohistory embraces research in neuroplasticity to explore past contexts of brain development, where now lost cultural influences and scripts of experience must have played formative roles. Now, it goes without saying that the actual brains here are missing. Um, but the neurohistorian works by piecing together context, practices, and historical dynamics of power together with testimony, description, and depiction of experience in historical terms. If you like, we're, we're world building. And the picture that emerges is one of historical brains constructing historical cultures and historical cultures forming historical brains, a, a dynamic relationship. Moreover, neurohistory examines uh, historically specific psychotropic influences on brain development, brain chemistry, and the perception of reality to show the extent to which the culturally mediated brain is uh, temporarily situated. Um, now, these psychotropic influences include um, what you might sort of readily think of, um, things like alcohol, coffee, tobacco, uh, or narcotics, um, and their introduction into various historical theaters. But it also explores what might be thought of as less obviously psychotropic factors, such as disease, new technology, atmospheric pollutants, or new cultural practices. Um, so you might think about the introduction of syphilis to South America, uh, the effect on the brain of the invention of movable type, and the sudden rise of mass literacy, of the spike in lead in the atmosphere after the Industrial Revolution, and of the cultural brain in the age of the internet. And the, the historiography now is, is beginning to fill in on a lot of these uh, specific themes. That human brains underwent sudden changes in development concomitant with acute changes in perceptions of reality, it seems beyond doubt. Now, uh, Smale's project, uh, brilliant uh, though it was, uh, hinged on an attachment to a fundamental biological structure that transcended humanity both in the present and in the deep historical past. Um, but I think the implications of his study nonetheless point to the collapse of a culture biology dyad. Um, and there've been a number of recent attempts to revise Smale's work uh, and, and neurohistory's aims uh, to pursue this collapse of the, of the nature culture uh, duality. They ask what value remains in thinking about so-called ancient parts of the brain or, or hardwired processes when such parts and processes are nonetheless always culturally situated and embodied and where experience is always culturally mediated. 
um, so how do you justify parceling bits and pieces off? Historians are beginning to embrace, um, maybe they really are only just beginning to embrace what I've uh, called biocultural historicism as further evidence of a plurally plastic human caught in a dynamic of formation that entangles brain, body, and world. And uh, I note there, there is a slight tension here with uh, one point in the introduction to the culture, mind, and brain um, volume when we're talking about uh, how to get past the nature culture um, or the nature nurture uh, uh, duality. Um, in, in the introduction, it says um, that uh, instead of resolving the nature nurture argument, um, we now require both operating in tandem. And I think I would rather dissolve the duality so that there's no such thing as a both. Um, I think that the both retains the duality. Um, and a biocultural approach can't really be squared away with that, with that binary. And I think on the whole, from you know, putting it in, a, in the context of the introduction, I think actually the book shares that intent. Um, so anyway, that, that more or less sums up what I um, say in my contribution to the volume. Um, and I wanna turn to a couple of important things that have happened since I wrote it and submitted it. Uh, the first thing is I was asked to uh, commission and edit an issue of Emotion Review um, on the history of emotions, um, which I was happy to do. Um, an Emotion Review, um, I guess many of you know, um, it really does take things from, from lots of different approaches to, to this, this field of emotion, but they're not always cross-pollinated. Um, so sometimes it feels like we're we're all in our little crucibles, but um, they don't necessarily uh, feed into each other. Um, so I took the idea that um, we should we should present the history of emotions as a mature field of study that ought to have serious critical purchase on emotion research across the disciplines. So that was the the brief. I wanted, to pe I wanted people to show how historical analyses sympathize with approaches from other disciplines, but I also wanted to show how history could be used to expose theoretical and methodological flaws in emotion research in other disciplines. So primarily, um, and most positively, it was supposed to be a bridge building project, but it did have a minor interest in bridge burning. Um, and I wanted the contributors to show how their historical research made use of approaches from other disciplines, but also how their own approach might be formative or transformative of approaches in those disciplines. So this special issue is predicated on the notion that historians do in fact produce knowledge about emotions, senses, experience about the biocultural human that is of interest and importance, not only to historians, but also in a way that critically disrupts expertise in emotions, senses, experience, and the biocultural human in other disciplines. So in general, I would urge you simply uh, to check it out. Um, it showcases some of the finest historians of emotion currently practicing um, from medieval Europe to modern neuroscience. Um, it covers everything from collective emotions to positive psychology, from the historicity of disgust elicitors to critical reflections on Darwinian research methods. Um, but here, I just wanna focus on two small elements of the issue. Uh, I think it came out in July. Um, the first is from uh, this article. Uh, it's by Daniel Gross and Stephanie Preston called Darwin and the Situation of Emotion Research. Um, and it focuses on the ways in which psychological research needs to adapt to the fact that it has become humanities adjacent. Now, uh, Gross, as you may know, is a professor of English, specializing in rhetoric and writing history. 
and the author of things like The Secret History of Emotion, and more recently, a book, uh, I think, with Chicago called Uncomfortable Situations, Emotion Between Science and the Humanities. Uh, Preston is a professor of psychology and a cognitive neuroscientist interested in neurobiology of empathy and altruism. So this is kind of like, you know, a dream combination for me. I was very happy uh, to get them. Um, and I think what they've done is produce a really quite original historical argument that is pointed at. It's very targeted at revolutionizing the way in which emotion, emotion science is done. Um, noting the influence of Charles Darwin's work on emotions, they demonstrate how far Darwin's method has been lost in the process of pinning specific psychological research goals on an eminent genealogy that in fact starts with Darwin. So they, they look at Darwin's own method in some detail and with it, they find fault with uh, contemporary preoccupations with controls, with delimitation of focus, and an overall level of specialism that leads to laboratory and experimental results that they say have no connection to the lived experience of emotion. They call for nothing less than a re-embrace of generalism within emotion science that would include the humanities in all aspects of emotion research. And they reach this insight through historical analysis. Um, and they, they leave off with an exhortation, like a slogan um, for the emotion lab, which is always historicize, uh, which I like, I wanna get t-shirts. Um, and I think it's a good slogan for cross-disciplinary research that is aimed at making visible the hidden assumptions that prompt uh, research and at limiting the kinds of claims that can be made about research that is necessary always itself situated in time and place. So Gross and Preston have come up with a general rubric for emotion research that could, could begin to materially alter what we do and what we do together. Um, the could is very, um, you know, uh, pregnant, I guess. We're, time will tell. Um, I think it's a good first stab at how historians might begin substantially to collaborate. Um, but I think it's still very much an open question. And it brings me to the second uh, element of this issue that I want to flag today. And this is from the terminal commentary uh, by Otnil Drawer, who's really one of the best uh, um, emotion historians out there, a historian of science, um, which is titled Historians in the Emotion Laboratory. And Drawer summarizes his view of the historian's role across disciplinary lines and highlights a specific challenge. And I'm gonna share this uh, lengthy quote with you and I'll read it to you. Um, it's, I'm going to spare you a very close analysis of what it says, because it's very wordy, um, but bear with me a sec. Um, the historian's contribution is to make imminent in scientific emotion that which is missing from contemporary science, the cosmology, the vocation, the perspective of the humanities writ large. It is to exemplify how cultural assumptions are implicitly integrated into laboratory experiments. It is to explicate how seemingly natural kinds are in fact social kinds. It is to reconceive private acts, for example, of irrationality in terms of their social rationality. It is to demonstrate how, how our basic and intimate experiences are constituted in part by our moral so, social valuations. It is to make ostensive the cultural scripting of seemingly reflex and pre-programmed physiological reactions. It is to challenge basic scientific tenets by studying the emotion history of the science of emotions rather than only the science history of emotions. It is in short to infuse the historian's know-how into emotion. The foundational challenge for a science humanities biocultural emotion is how do we infuse the know-how of the humanities in the, into the laboratory and into scientific protocol? Okay, there's, there's really a lot to unpack there. Um, and I could spend a long time 
doing that. I'm going to spare you. Um, I just want to say that on good days, uh, I see that we're already making this kind of step. Um, and I actually think the culture mind brain volume is such a step. Um, um, and to me, it's not really so much about having physical presence of historians in the laboratory, so much as it is about registering an, an intellectual presence, both in the way in which uh, research questions are um, planned and oriented, and also of injecting historical awareness into the ways in which laboratory findings are interpreted and reported. And just to kind of set against this passage from, from Drawer, um, I thought it might be productive to offer a reading of one passage from the introduction to the Culture, Mind and Brain uh, book um, that I think might have come out slightly differently um, through the historian's gaze. Um, and uh, I offer it as simply as an example of the ways in which um, critical engagement with each other across disciplinary lines might tighten our idea of what our research can do and our understanding of what we can learn from it. So like, you know, I, I, want, I don't want this to sound critical. I want it to sound uh, productive. Um, so here's the, the passage in the introduction um, uh, to the book. Uh, the neurodevelopmental processes that give rise to human capacities for language, thought, and creativity extend beyond the brain to include interactions with the environment and especially with other people. On a small scale, we can study these interactions in the laboratory by examining brain function in response to socially and ecologically meaningful stimuli. Methods of hyperscanning, for example, imaging the brains of two or more people while they interact with each other in naturalistic settings can reveal the process, processes of coordination, synchrony, and mutual regulation that may underlie crucial aspects of social behavior and help account for aspects of our feelings of empathy and mutual understanding or of strangeness and hostility. These new technologies allow us to move beyond theory construction to begin to explore the functional links between the brain and the social world. Okay, uh, so aside from picking out certain historical constructions like the word empathy, which has had no stable definition in its very short history and about which there's a fairly rich historiography, um, I would make a more general observation that such a research plan would, would have to be contextually limited. So it may well allow us to begin to explore the functional links between the brain and the social world, but only in its own moment in time and place within a very specific space, pr probably the lab. And within an understanding that an historically specific conceptual framework is already built into research design before any measuring takes place. Then the measurer is not a neutral actor. What we might see and interpret as it were objectively is bound up with technologies and techniques of measuring and with situated modes of seeing and of reading. So uh, if you inject into, into this kind of uh, passage, um, uh, an engagement with what historians of science or uh, science studies uh, do, then I think what you would get is if you, you wouldn't fundamentally change the passage, but you would add a few checks on the narrative by disrupting the implicit neutrality of the processes of producing and interpreting brain imagery. If we're to pursue the dynamic relation of culture, mind and brain, then I think we have to become accustomed to building in um, these temporal and local caveats into the knowledge we produce, as well as going to great lengths to understand our own implicit assumptions. For example, that empathy is, empathy is something that exists or that we can do and brain research to understand its function. Like th those things a historian would say are highly problematic or that we can readily identify such a thing as a romantic couple, which uh, was mentioned in this text, or even that such a thing as the social world um, sort of means anything in a, in a sort of trans-historical sense. 
So I say they're not, they're not just quibbles. Um, um, they don't fundamentally alter the intent here, but they do uh, register a certain restraint. Um, and they go to the heart of the knowledge contribution um, of historians um, that all knowledge production techniques must necessarily be situated in time and place. Um, so, I mean, in a, in a broader sense, um, uh, historians offer a check against hubris, um, uh, but I think more positively, on the other hand, um, historians encourage researchers to constantly incorporate cultural specificity in their research, both the cultural specificity of the experimental subject, uh, but crucially also the reflexive and critical understanding of their own culture of scientific practice and the broader cultural framework that they bring with them to the lab. And, and one way to get at this is to engage uh, broadly with historians uh, and their work, and as Gross and Preston urge, to always historicize. Um, uh, we've, we've developed over many years methodologies for analyzing cultures of scientific practice. Um, Lorraine Daston called it the moral economy of science. Um, and these um, methodologies and these historical case studies are good to think with because contemporary research isn't exempt from these uh, these forces, these uh, cultural webs. Um, so these studies show how scientific knowledge production is essentially culturally and politically specific. Okay, so this brings me to the second important thing that's happened since I submitted uh, the chapter to the Culture, Mind and Brain book, uh, which is the writing of this small um, book, uh, Emotion, Sense, Experience, with uh, the eminent historian of the senses, Professor Mark Smith. Um, this book, uh, which just came out, uh, is fundamentally um, about asking historians to change their understanding of what they do and why, but with a built-in implication that history must speak beyond its disciplinary boundary. Um, it's about history as a critical check on knowledge production in other fields, as well as contributing to knowledge production in an interdisciplinary space. So I just want to say a few words about uh, how this came about and what and what it's about. Um, so Mark approached me about writing something together um, to deal with uh, a shared sense of frustration, actually, um, about the rapid expansion of the histori historiography in the history of emotions and the history of the senses. Um, this was back in the summer of 2018. Um, Mark had identified what he thought was an urgent problem, um, which was that the history of emotions and the history of the senses uh, were two distinct fields and not one. Um, and that made no sense. Um, and he thought it was urgent that these two fields become enfolded. Um, since both those fields had rapidly ballooned in the last 10 years, um, the cost of them being separate uh, was becoming more and more evident. Um, they, they're they both entrenched in their blind spots. Um, and um, the result was that you end up carrying these um, sort of contemporary categories of emotion and sense and projecting them back into the past, uh, which is precisely the opposite of what um, the historians of these things are supposed to be doing. Um, so um, the research and writing for this book um, bridged the preparation of my chapter in the Culture, Mind and Brain volume. Um, but while they ended up being published at about the same time, uh, the substantial part of the writing of this book uh, only happened this year during lockdown. Um, I was in Finland, Mark's in South Carolina. And so I think it's a bit more up to date um, and it's also a, a more elaborate, um, you know, it's, it's a much longer uh, treatise. Um, so while the audience is in the main historians, uh, we did imagine it to have an important bearing in other disciplines. Um, in its shift towards a biocultural approach to the history of experience, we're aiming to clarify what we mean by bioculture and crucially also the word experience. 
in setting about combining the history of emotions and the history of senses and in finding and exploring their common origins, um, we mark this sense of dissatisfaction about these categories of emotion and sense and their tendency to skew us towards uh, presentism, towards anachronism. Um, however much they've opened up our fields to great expansion, they've actually become barriers. Um, and we, we've we labeled the last 10 years or so in, in our fields as a kind of additive phase of historiographical bloom, which is to say that there's an enormous amount of work now, but it's not necessarily um, adding a huge amount of quality or furthering our understanding. Um, and this problem especially concerned us because of the current fractured intellectual landscape in the discipline of psychology. Um, why? Because historians tend to borrow. Um, and um, what we noticed was that uh, they borrow without being particularly aware of the intellectual politics going on in psychology right now. And so they end up aligning themselves without fully realizing what's at stake. So what to do? We not just to kind of um, enfold two fields, but do something new. Um, and here we turn to experience, a way of proceeding in combination uh, instead of simply making a messy join. And experience is definitely in the air at the moment in history writing and beyond. Um, and I note in passing that the word experience plays a key role in the culture, mind and brain volume. Um, and I think increasingly we're going to have to establish precisely what we're talking about and what we're not talking about when we talk about experience. Um, to be avoided at all costs, please, um, is the kind of definitional plurality that has blighted categories like emotion and affect. Um, Mark and I were looking for something that wouldn't be too tightly bound, something that could uh, not be essentialized or reified. Um, in our approach, for which emotion sense experience is the blueprint and not the last word, we think we found a way forward. Um, so I had been developing an idea for the new history of experience um, in a couple of books, um, uh, History of Emotions from 2018 and History of Feelings from 2019. And I, I was sort of feeling out a path towards experience and not really elaborating a methodology, um, but we felt that we could and should go further, however much it's still going to be open and pre preliminary. Um, and I, I must say, at every point writing together, we found there was almost limitless scope for elaboration. Um, but we've kind of taken the temperature of what we can do um, and provided what might be considered somewhat provocative blueprint for the history of experience. So what do we mean by it? Um, well, first I'm gonna say what we don't mean by it. Um, it's easier. Um, so we don't mean by experience um, an intellectual history of the word or the concept of experience such that was written by Martin Jay. Um, we don't think there's any need for the word experience or any similar concept to be in play in an historical context in order to pursue the history of experience. We also don't mean for a return to the notion of experience as universal or part of an anthropological constant. Um, there's an older iteration of something called the history of experience and we are at great pains to distance ourselves from it. Uh, this is not Diltai's experience, it's not Collingwood's experience and it's not Kaselik's experience. The historian, we say, neither re-experiences nor re-enacts the past. We don't have access to past experiences based on who or what we are or how we identify. We're not arguing that our own experience as human beings has any analytical value as evidence for historical human beings in the past. And to that end, we're following Joan Scott's article here, The Evidence of Experience, and a well-known warning in it. Uh, her criticism, I think this is from 1991, um, 
uh, of appeals to the evidence of experience was couched in the primacy of discourse and the abandonment of the body. So she criticized those who turned to feelings because they assumed that the category represented a reality that could not be subsumed by language. Uh, she called it a pre-discursive reality directly felt, felt, seen, and known. And on those terms, experience establishes a realm of reality outside of discourse and authorizes the historian who has access to it. So she's talking about, you know, uh, women writing women's history with access because they're women or um, uh, black historians writing black history um, uh, with great access because they're black or queer history because you're queer. Uh, and she's basically dismissing that idea. Uh, she wanted to take all categories of analysis as contextual, contested and contingent, um, but she couldn't work out how this could apply to the brain or body, so she dismissed them. Um, so essentially, she, she identified the problem in the early 1990s, that, but said you couldn't have a history of experience because you essentially can't write a history of the body and brain. There's only discourse. Our new history of experience that we outlined shares the desire to treat the emergence of concepts and identities as historical events in need of explanation, just as Scott said, but it doesn't any longer assume that it can do this within a realm of language that's disembodied. We no longer presume to isolate conceptual history from the history of the brain, from the history of emotions and senses, from the history of the plastic body. And it's precisely this change of perspective that mutually implicates historians and social neuroscientists in each other's work. So in sum, what we want to do is get at what it was like to be there then. And we're riffing in saying that on something Lynn Hunt said some years ago in this article, uh, The Experience of Revolution, but we could not depart more radically from Hunt in terms of our assumptions and methods. Hunt basically aligns herself with affect theory. We want to get at what it was like to be there then through the historicization of affective, sensory, and cognitive experience through situated and embodied concepts and expressions in play in discrete historical contexts. We want to get at what it was like to be there then through an historicization of the brain body system in its dynamic relation with the world or context. Our biocultural approach allows no room for a space between bio and culture, allows no reference to isolated or simply automatic biology or for disembodied and disembrained social construction. We're essentially abandoning the implicit presence of human nature in historical writing and calling for sort of replacement with bioculture. Now here, uh, we are of course taking some insights from social neuroscience and some from cultural anthropology. Um, we don't do so uncritically and we don't borrow also without intending to, to lend. Indeed, as, should, as by now it should be clear, we're committed to a sustained engagement with social neuroscientists with a view to altering or having some say in the social neuroscientific research agenda according to the knowledge produced by historians and with a kind of readiness that historians might also have to give something up in the bargain. We end up with history as it actually was. And I put that in inverted commas because it's a very old historical slogan from the 1870s. Um, but our history as it actually was is not Leopold von Ranke's uh, history as it actually was. Maybe put it better, we're pushing for a history as it was actually lived, a history as it was perceived by historical actors with full due given to the actor's own terms of the perception of reality and without imposing our own. So this is a kind of radical historicism that we're aiming for, where we want to abandon any presentist assumptions and we know how difficult that is. Um, and we include a healthy dose of skepticism about the value or meaning of things like empathy, agency, subjectivity, and authenticity to try to rebuild 
or reconstitute experience as it was lived in the time and place it was lived. And if this registers as another slight point of tension with, with some parts of the introduction of the Culture, Mind and Brain book, I would hope that this also is a productive tension, uh, something that can inspire um, more collaboration. Um, there's a passage there, for example, about um, memory narrativity in the self, which sits a little bit at odds with what we have written. Um, I think mainly because it lacks a political dimension and also an appreciation of radical historical differences in self-understanding and even the absence of such. Subjectivity as we might understand it is historically specific, so is agency. Where such concepts were available to historical actors or, or, or were not, sorry, available to historical actors, we can't impose them. So we need to keep in mind how selves are formed or denied according to the lines, exclu lines of exclusion drawn by cultural models that are constructed to make themselves available to some but unavailable to others. And this, in the historical record, this is often evidenced by a silence, uh, by a gap. And I suspect that that gap actually exists in the research methodologies of other disciplines, but it's easy to miss it. Historians have long been trained to piece together the structures that create these kinds of silence and to be able to hear, however partially, what those silences uh, say. It's quite fundamental to what we do. Employing contemporary knowledge about the plasticity of the biocultural brain and pursuing its implications to recover modes of experience that have become lost. To research perceptions of reality and the practices associated with those perceptions without assuming that our own culturally and temporally specific human, humanness grants us any insight into it automatically. But perhaps the most important contribution um, is to work with a problem that arises from understandings of brain plasticity and of biocultural dynamics, namely to account for change over time. That is, and this is my last word, not simply to show that experience is historical, but to show how experiential change occurs. And that's where I'll leave it. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. Uh, very rich and, and provocative. Uh, um, I, let, let me begin with a, a, a comment or reflection related to your interaction with the book and with the, the introduction to the book. And that will be a way to, to frame a particular question I have to you, which is um, largely methodological. Um, in the passage that you quoted about hyper scanning and, and trying to look at, um, uh, you know, two people at the same time interacting in the laboratory and so on. Um, as, as one of the people who co wrote that, that paragraph, um, what, what is going on there is vis a vis certain things that are not stated. Uh, and, and I, so I'm going to say something about that. And then to me, it seems obvious that this is central to the whole dilemma of, of doing history, where you're trying to build a picture of what's really going on in some sense or what. So that, that paragraph is pushing back against a view uh, that says that to understand the brain, we just need to look at one brain uh, inside the skull and figure out what's going on there. So that's the first thing. And it's vis-a-vis -vis that kind of dominant frame, which we see present in our colleagues in the work around us and so on, uh, that we're, you know, we, we have in mind. And the other part that it's pushing back against is the idea that um, not just that the brain depends on the environment, but that the brain depends on other people. And it depends on other people in certain kinds of, what can we say, formatted or structured or already given to some degree situations or scenarios so that there is a, an irreducible social element but that doing that fully in the world with, you know, to, to measure things that we might be curious about is technically extremely difficult. Maybe someday we'll be there. We'll have the Star Trek uh, scanner kind of thing and we'll be able to, you know, we, we have little bits of that we can do now. Uh, but the idea would be that there's something intermediate going on here, 
and with full knowledge that it's going to be a very watered down version. I think we use some phrase like on a small scale or something. And again, we're just saying, here's a little bit of something that might be a constituent of other things if you're trying to build a picture of, of what's going on in, in interactions. So, so I'll begin with that comment just to say, it's not a claim at all that this is the way to do science or that this all, already this paradigm or that as an example, contains all the things we might be interested in. It's only a, a pushing back against a particularly limited version, uh, which is where most of the work is done, partly for pragmatic reasons, partly because of certain commitments that we think people have uh, to what's interesting. So having said that, and I'm interested to hear your comments on that and sort of putting that comment now, my, my, my little story of what's going on in our heads or in our conversations, me and the other co-editors in terms of writing this thing, i um, interested in hearing your historical reflection on that. But I also want to point out that it, it, for me, anyway, as a non-historian, it raises an interesting question about history, which is I've just given you a little bit of oral history, at least my own, you know, as, as a participant observer, kind of my own sense of what was going on, which, you know, may or may not be, uh, I don't know, may or may not be an accurate account or may not be the most important thing that was going on. Uh, how do you get that? You know, to what extent do you get that when you're looking at, um, well, either everyday discourse in terms of so what, what's at stake and what are people really, you know, using certain modes of expression or ways of framing their experiences, what are they really about in doing that, or in, even in the, the subdomain or the technical domain of producing scientific knowledge or, or scholarly knowledge at a given point in time. Uh, because certainly, again, it's my overall feeling as a scholar, one is always speaking to some other person, and often one takes a uh, a position, not because it's the all-encompassing position, but because it's some kind of corrective or, or, or a response to something else. But sometimes that, that other thing is not totally obvious what it is or not, not totally put on the table. Yeah, um, thanks. It's actually, I was hoping that you would say something like this. Um, <laughs> uh, because I think that uh, this, uh, this passage uh, and I have to say in general, like if you read the whole of the introduction to this book, um, I come away with it anyway, uh, with the with the definitely the right impression that I'm fully on board with what's going on here. Um, and I can see how um, uh, the historical discipline uh, can fit into it. Um, what I think is really interesting when you talk about um, if you like the um, the invisible thing that you're pushing back against um, I think when we're in our disciplinary silos, we all do this all the time. Um, and within our disciplinary silos, it's obvious what you're pushing back against. Um, and when you're writing in this, um, what I think is incredibly difficult interdisciplinary space, um, those, uh, those obvious uh, presences become non-obvious all of a sudden. And um, and I, and I, I think that there's, um, there's some practical difficulties here because, you know, you can't wring your hands and, and pull out your hair about every single line if you're, you know, when you're writing in collaboration, it's just, you know, you, you could go crazy, never finish anything. Um, but I would say that um, uh, if I go back to my personal reflection about the kind of resistance that I get from um, historians about their own encounters with people who work, say, in, um, in laboratories scanning brains, is that when they engage with the published literature, to whatever extent that they do, and it's usually not much, what they register first and foremost is um, uh, a lack of any kind of um, uh, um, self-reflection about the limitedness of some of the things that they're saying, um, you know, um, and um, without sort of putting too fine a point on it or naming any names, I, I sort of remember um, back at the Max Planck uh, Institute for Human Development in Berlin, we would occasionally have to have these uh, day long or two day long events where um, all the researchers whose contracts needed to be renewed would have to give five minute presentations uh, to the whole uh, institute. Um, and there, so there would be, you know, um, a couple of hundred psychologists and, and uh, 40 odd historians. Um, 
and it didn't make for a good room. Um, and and the, in general, in, in general, the historian's comments to uh, psychology presentations was, uh, uh, well, you haven't thought about gender, you haven't thought about um, you know power, um, you haven't thought about like the the kind of ethnographic biases, like you know they would just point out all of the things that people in the humanities work with every day, and these poor guys are just like well, it's just not what we do. Um, and you can see, just as you said, that their their target, their in Germany they just call them enemies. Um, <laughs> uh, their enemies were, you know, people in closely aligned fields to their own. And uh, and so I, I can, you know, you have to kind of accept that as um, um, that's an occupational hazard. But what I would say is that um, when you make a conscious attempt to reach out and, and really carve out this interdisciplinary space, then, um, well, all of us have to be prepared to have certain things just pointed out. And I would say the same about me, right? You know, I, I, I would present something and expect people to come at it with uh, disciplinary knowledge and specialisms that I simply don't have access to that will change how I write things. Um, and so that's why I say that pointing out little bits like that actually can be productive for us. Um, because on the whole, the, the thing is, is great. And then you get these little bits where, you know, my disciplinary alarm bell goes off and you say, okay, that I would have written that slightly differently. I would not have changed the intent, just would have written it slightly differently. And it's about um, keeping that access for you know, the soft underbelly of historians who might be interested in this kind of thing. Um, and that brings me to the second point, which is about, um, you know, uh, wanting to inquire into something like this is limited um, in terms of, you know, how you can do it you, and you can't do it in the world, as you say. Um, you, if you want to design something like this, it's got to take place in, in something that's uh, that's limited. Um, I think the the historian's perspective on that is all of our work is the is the opposite. All of our work takes place like in this great worlded theater. And yes, all right, you can you can uh, conceive of historical research projects that are extremely narrow and limited to something very tight and um, sort of a micro space, um, but um, hardly anybody has the sources to do that well. And in general, we're always looking at the bigger picture. We're always looking at that, that landscape into which something fits. And so those are the kinds of questions that, that historians always bring to these situated lab experiments. And, and that's why in that article by Gross and Preston, they're saying, we understand that you have to do these things in the lab but bring a kind of generalism with you and be explicit about what you're doing and not doing so that people outside of your field will engage with it and not just damn you straight off the bat because I've seen that happen so many times and it's usually unjustified. Um, so that's, that's my response to that is that I, I think um, there is a way to do this together that, um, if you like, um, maybe gets away from the pushing back at our our disciplinarily bound uh, nemeses for the sake of actually being more powerful together. Um, you know, there's there's more strength in allying across these disciplinary lines. It's extremely interesting and, and you know, speaks to the, the very broad project of this interdisciplinarity or transdisciplinary or finding the languages that will work uh, in multiple directions at the same time, kind of. And it, it's very salient to me right now because we're beginning this process of, of uh, looking at um, how to translate contemporary neuroscience research into policy and practice relevant to social contexts. And, you know, terribly daunting to get beyond the rhetoric that, you know, this wonderful science is going to give us all kinds of answers and, and, and to try to grapple with real uh, 
real world situations which are expansive, which are you know densely uh, woven together, uh, and and you know how to say something that's not um, either you know not nonsensical or totally self-serving or or both. Uh, I think is is a real challenge. Yeah, I mean you know uh, I I think his policy is the area where historians fear to tread. Um, um, and that's precisely why they should be on board, um, because I've I've seen um, small articles written by social neuroscientists, so I won't name, um, in which the policy implications are put front and center, and um, and the the kind of alarm bells that they set off in someone who's, you know, got a bit of historical awareness. Um, are are acute and very loud and um, and I just think well you know that would have been so much better put through someone else's brain for a few minutes um, uh, and and that's why there's there's enormous value in doing things together as long as we can carry on being productive and we don't um, thwart each other with you know uh, creative differences. Excellent. Thank you all for your uh, questions and discussion. Thank you, especially uh, Rob, for uh, being with us and, and giving us you know, the depth of your reflection.